Father, I thank you and praise you with all my heart. Holy Spirit, may you lead us and direct us as you always have. Even when you, we were not faithful, you were always faithful. And so, Lord, I, I, I do not take it for granted being up here and for my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, for any one of us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done and what you're about to do. May you strengthen those who are listening, Lord. Strengthen those, Father, who, who truly are seeking you. There has to be a desire. So, Lord, I pray that those who are desiring are listening. You draw them. Give them clarity. Give them understanding. And your will be done, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The message today is entitled, The Time is Near. Now, there are three things that I want to point out to you. There's a slide that I'll bring up shortly. But I want to read the first scripture this morning, Revelation 1.3. And it says here, Blessed is he who reads and hears the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Now, Revelation 1.3 is very clear. It says that when you read prophecy, when you hear the word of prophecy, it says that you're blessed. It comes with a blessing. Who wants to be blessed today? And so Revelation 1.3 clearly says that. Blessed is he who reads and hears the words of the prophecy of this book. It is not just pertaining to the book of Revelation, but to the entire prophecy in the written word of God. So when you understand prophetic things, you're blessed. Why? Because you're understanding the warning of God. God is not a God of all, all of a sudden judgment falls. God is a God of warning. He has always warned his people. And that, and that is what God is doing today. He is warning people. He is warning of the coming judgment that is coming. Why? Because salvation has been here. For the past 2,000 years, the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ has been available for all, for anyone, any part of the world, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, the grace and the love of Jesus Christ has been open. His arms have been wide open. And I thank God for that. We were all once lost in darkness. But we've come into his marvelous light. But you see, God loves the world. God loves all people, even today. Even those people that you would think are enemies, God loves them. But the fact is, is that the judgment of God is coming. And so I believe that the Christian who makes up the body of Christ, when they understand prophetic things, it allows us to be a more effective witness a member of the body of Christ to accomplish the will of God see in Revelation 1 3 it says the time is near the time is near what 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 is near I believe for many of you in the sanctuary and those watching online who've been a Christian for quite some time you understand exactly what I'm saying when I say the time is near whether it be the rapture of the church or whether it be the, the, the coming of the final Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, whatever it may be, the time is near. Not only that, but it can also refer to the time is near as this may be your last day on this earth. Have you fulfilled all that God has called you to do? It don't matter how young or how old you are. Have you fulfilled all that God has called you to do? The time is near. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. But when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, when you stand before God Almighty, whether it be the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, two different judgments, you pray that you stand before the judgment seat of Christ because why? Because that is where God will honor your rewards. He will honor the work that you did in the body of Christ. And that is so important for the Christian to understand that as a, as a Christian, when we go before the Lord Jesus Christ one day, He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Isn't that what the scripture says? We should encourage each other, remind each other of, of one day of our personal meeting with Jesus in this manner. There, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, I want to read to you Matthew 24, verse 37. Jesus says, but as the days of Noah, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. What were the days of Noah like? We're going to get there in just a moment. Look also in Luke 17, verse 28 through 30. It says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, 
They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So the scripture teaches us that in the days of Lot and in the days of Noah, so shall it be when Jesus comes back. Whether that be the rapture of the church or whether that even be the second coming of Christ, two totally different events. But the Bible teaches us that, and what's wrong with eating and drinking? Are we supposed to eat and drink? Without eating and drinking, we die. Uh, what's wrong with, with building and planning and selling and buying? What's wrong with, with marrying and raising kids? What's wrong with these things? There's nothing wrong with these things. Amen? Life is beautiful. Life is precious. Amen? There's nothing wrong with buying a new home. But what's wrong with these things? The thing that was wrong in the days of Lot, in the days of Noah, is that when they were doing these things, they were not honoring to God. The homes, the selling, the buying of things, the, the giving in marriage, they were not honoring to God, but in fact, they were dishonoring God. They were dishonoring God. They were perverting the ways of God. Amen? And so we look at today, at society today, we see how marriage has been under attack and is now in America fully redefined. You know, I was saying it Friday night, who, who, who goes to Credit Karma to check on their uh, credit score? Yeah, I do. I have the Credit Karma app just to check on my credit score, make sure things are okay, you know, N nothing... Uh, surprise on there you know somebody charged something or whatever but I was working out the other day yes I work out yes I do and and uh, I was working out and I was as I was watching the TV as I was on the treadmill I saw the credit karma commercial come on and there were these two men older men laying in bed talking about buying a house together looking at their credit and and you know commercial after commercial after commercial you know again I'm not judging these people but the Bible is very clear that this lifestyle is an abomination in the eyes of God. Michael Garcia did not say that. The Word of God says that. Sadly, many Christians are afraid to stand on the Word of God, the truth. I'm not judging these people for what their lifestyle. I'm not judging them. Actually, I love them. As a Christian, we're to love them. Not be entertained by their sin, but we're to love them and, 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 to, and to stand for what is righteous and holy that they may be convicted of their sin as you were once convicted of your sin. But you see, the church gives in to compromise. Well, we have to give a little to get a little. That's not true. Jesus didn't give anything. Jesus represents truth. He is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so as I saw this commercial, it began to remind me of so many commercials that I have seen recently where where they're pushing this lifestyle, this agenda, where they're pushing this now, where, where even a, a senior who graduated here uh, last week, uh, somewhere in the United States, I can't remember where, but they made a comment talking about for being abortion, for be, being for abortion. And Hillary Clinton and so many uh, politicians were just tweeting saying, way to go, good job, you have a bright future ahead of you. And we know that the Bible is, is against such things. See, people think, Michael, when you talk about these things, you're being political. No, I'm not. These are moral issues. And God speaks about the murder in the womb. God speaks about the sexual immorality. God speaks about these things. But the church, the church is afraid to speak about these things. And so we see that in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, Sin was rampant. The life style of many people were like this. Look in verse uh, Genesis chapter um, 18, verse 17 through 21. I'll go there in just a minute, but let me explain this to you. And let me explain how, how this perceives today. What we saw how God moved in the days of Noah when the flood came, and when we saw how God moved in the day of Lot when he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, how God moved in those days we can also see how God will move in our day. Because again, what does Jesus say in the scriptures we just read? Just as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And so we have to understand that God is not the type of person, uh, individual, or someone that wants to just surprise us. We have read the Bible for a reason, so we can study how humanity, humanity never changes, God never changes, and the devil never changes. 
And we can see how the behaviors in the, of, of humanity has always been the same. And we can see that from Noah's day and Lot's day, how we see it today. But before I read into that, let me tell you that God will always reveal himself to the believer before he moves upon the face of the earth. Do you know that? Look at Genesis 18, verse 17 through 21. In our day today, God is about to move in a way of bringing judgment. You see, we're crying for revival. I've never heard so many Christians cry for judgment. Do you know when the fifth seal is opened up in heaven, do you know they're crying for judgment? The saints that are in heaven, when the, when the fifth seal in the book of Revelation is opened up, the saints are not crying for revival in the church. They're crying for judgment to come upon the earth. But yet in the church, we're crying for revival. What should we be crying? We, we, you know what? We should not be crying for revival. Why? You want to know why? Because we're supposed to be in revival. We're supposed to stay in revival. We're not supposed to be wander from revival. What is revival? A renewed passion for God and for people. So I think it's a deadly thing when the church says we need revival. I've been there. You've been there. We've heard so many churches. We need revival. We need revival. We should have never, never left revival. What is revival? Hanging from the chandelier, speaking in tongues, prophesying, getting slain in the spirit. Is that revival? Revival is a renewed passion for God and for people. That is what revival is. Because when Jesus came, that's what he brought. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, and soul, and love your brother as well. That is the greatest and second greatest commandment. That's revival, guys. We've all strayed away from it. I, as a pastor, have strayed away from that. But through His grace and mercy, He brings us back. May we never leave that again. May we never leave that again. We learn valuable lessons. It, it's not easy when you fail God. Even as a Christian, it, it's not easy if you failed God. But God is faithful, and He speaks to His people. Look, in, in Genesis 18, it says here, And the Lord said to Abraham, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, what I am doing? Well, what was God doing? What was God fixing to do in Genesis 18? Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great nation and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. The Lord God was telling Abraham, so to speak, I was up in heaven, the sin was so grave that it rose to my throne room, and I have come down to visit to see if this is really true. You know, God doesn't need to come down to the earth to see if it's really true. He was playing out the formality, speaking to a human being, so, and a, so that a human could understand in his own understanding. God doesn't need to come down to the earth to say, oh, it's true. God can sit from his throne and know all things. He does know all things. But he was playing out the formality of things. And he was go getting ready to go and judge Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. Lot being Abraham's nephew. But before he did that, he revealed to Abraham what he was about to do. God is revealing to many faithful men and women of the Lord Jesus Christ through the body of Christ today in the church what God is about to do. And I'm telling you in my heart, the Lord is saying, you're crying for revival. You're crying for revival. The Lord is saying, the church should have always been in revival. We are never to leave revival. From the day we become a Christian, we're in revival. And we should stay there. When we start crying for revival, that means we've backslidden. So it is not biblical for a Christian to cry for revival in regards to the New Testament church. What is biblical is to cry for judgment. Because you see the saints... Again, in heaven, when the fifth seal is opened, they're crying for the judgment to come upon the earth, to judge the inhabitants who hate God. You think, well, that's kind of harsh, but it's biblical. Because in the judgment that comes, it also brings the resurrection. You see, we don't hate the sinner, but we hate sin, and we hate the effects of sin. And this is, this is to be the heart of God, and this is the heart of the church, that we avoid sin at all costs. 
We're not perfect. We're not perfect, but we should hate it because of what it does to us, what it does to humanity, what, is, what it is doing. It brings death. And what do light and darkness have in common? Nothing. And so God reveals to Abraham what he is about to do. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 8 and 11 through 12, I want to read to you very quickly the condition of Noah in his day. This is going to be, uh, the scripture is going to allow us to understand in regards to unidentified flying objects. And I'm going to speak to you and, and I want you to hold on real tightly about what I'm about to say because this is something you may never have heard before. But I want to show you through the Bible how these things still may exist on the earth today. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 8 it says, Now it came to pass in the day of Noah when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to the men that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now what's wrong with the sons of God going and having children with the daughters of men? In the Hebrew, when you look at verse 2, when it says the sons of God, in the Hebrew, that is actually translated as angels. Angels. Do you hear me this morning? There's something a lot of the church does not understand about the Nephilim, about the giants that once roamed the face of the earth. This was an, an incredible sin that was happening in the world. But what does that mean today? Look, you don't need to believe and understand really this topic of the Nephilim to attain salvation, to receive salvation, to be a Christian. You don't really. But it helps you to understand what we're about to face and facing even now. So look, and God saw this, and he said, my spirit shall not be with this. God could not give his spirit to this. God could not give his approval to this. God told Adam and Eve, fill the earth, multiply. But when they started to do this, God said, I will not be with this. In 120 years, I'm bringing judgment. That is exactly what the scripture says. Verse 4, it says this, and there were giants on the earth in those days. And look, very importantly, and also afterward. Before the flood, and after the flood. There were giants. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This was an ungodly race that was being produced. Now again, some of you may choke on this spiritually, but please bear with Scripture. Listen to what Scripture is teaching. Please. This was something that was disapproving to God. And so there were giants on the earth before the flood, and it says, and also afterward. You remember King David? When King David fought a giant? But you see, the flood happened. It erased all of humanity. But then the giants showed up again after the flood. Why? How? If God put an end to it, why did it happen again? Again, the, the, when angels fell, it was not just a one-time event. Angels were continuing to fall. That this is something that, that, that is very deep, that Scripture doesn't give light to very much, but it helps us to understand the condition of Noah's day. Watch this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now, it's not the sorry that we understand where God says, man, I shouldn't have done that. That's not what God is saying. It, God already knew what was going to happen before he even created the world. But again, God plays out the formality for human to understand why he does what he does. When God made the earth, he knew what he was going to do. He knew Jesus knew he was going to have to come and did what he had to do. But so that we could understand this grieved the heart of God. Yes, God's heart can be grieved. Verse 7, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, look, and beast. Why, why just, not just man, why the animals too? Because the animals were involved in sin. There was such 
vile, filthy, gross, immoral things happening on the earth that God said, I'm even going to destroy the beast. Because even afterwards, the Egyptians worshipped beasts. Even today, they worship the, 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 today they worship the cow. They worship so many of the beasts. But, but before Noah's, in Noah's day, it was even worse. And not only that, but you had the giants on the face of the earth. This was the offspring of fallen angels and the daughters of men. Producing this Nephilim, the giant means the fallen ones, the mighty ones. And they were devourers of men. They were devourers of the earth. And so it's so much, you know, where you talk about how dinosaurs once existed. Yes, this was in the days of dinosaurs. The, the, the scientists will tell you dinosaurs existed 90 million years ago or, you know, I don't know the technology and how they can even think that that exists. But according to God's word, it was not that long ago. How can we look at a rock and say, well, that rock's 10,000 years old and this one is 10 million years old. And then they've proven themselves to be wrong time after time. The, the wisdom of, of, of man is foolishness in the sight of God. Isn't that what scripture says? But Noah, it says in uh, verse 7, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that is so important for the church today that you must find grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is willing to give you things you don't deserve. And God was willing to bless Noah. Again, the giants are the Nephilim, mighty ones, fallen ones. King David dealt with Goliath. After the flood, giants appeared on the earth once again. Why? Because there was a continual sin of this. Why do you think God told Moses when he went into the promised land to annihilate the, the Amalekites? To annihilate certain people. You want to know why? Because you see atheists, when they hear this and they said, how could a loving God go into, tell Moses to go into the promised land and kill all the people, men, women, and children, and beasts? How, how could a loving God tell Moses to do things like that? Well, because people fail to understand that before the flood, we saw what fallen angels were doing. An angel can take the form of a human being. Do you remember when when the Lord, uh, when the two angels, the, the Lord sent the two angels into Sodom and Gomorrah to tell Lot to leave. They were in the form of men and they appeared to the men of Sodom and Gomorrah and the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have sex with them because these two angels were in the form of man. And it was visible by the, the sight of a human being to see the, these two angels as men and they were desirable to want to have sex. That's what the human beings wanted to do to have sex. Do you think that a fallen angel cannot do the same thing? Take the form of a man? They can. Satan, in the form of a serpent, went into the garden. The Bible says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He can appear to be beautiful. You know, that they have not lost the, the, what God has given to them to be able to appear in certain ways and certain things and take form. And so this is what happened with, with these angels fallen angels having sex with the daughters of men and it was creating a perverted race and so God told Moses as he told King David take this one out take this one out go and take them all out because these were people that God had dealt with once before and they were populating the earth once again but let me just tell you this the Bible is very clear there were giants on the earth before the flood and after the flood and this is just my opinion I honestly believe that giants still exist on the earth today. They may not be seven, eight, nine feet tall, but why do you think Hollywood pushes so many of these movies about superheroes having superhuman strength? Because you see, Jewish tradition teaches that these giants were of superhuman strength and they were looked upon as superheroes, so to speak. And why do you think humanity has fallen for this? They love the story of superheroes, Superman, Batman, all these intelligent, and right? Humanity is sucked up into that today. We're entertained by these things. We're in, how many movies today come out through Hollywood that, 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 that are entertaining the people with, with demonic possession, demonic oppression, 
So many satanic movies dabbling in the occult. They're out in the theaters today and so many people flock to see these films. Why do you think so? Because humanity has never changed. Our heart as a human being is naturally wicked. And we're entertained by these things. We're drawn to these things. But thank God, Christian, for the Spirit of God who comes into us and He changes us and He transforms us and He gives us wisdom to avoid these things. But this stuff is still in the world today. What the scriptures say, just as it was in the days of Lot, in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. There is a great possibility that there are still giants on the earth today. They may not be nine feet tall, but they have supernatural powers. Look, Somebody sent me an article, and I promise I, I will get to read into it soon. But I told my wife last week that the government was going to be allowing uh, files, top secret files to come out about UFOs, about things that are explaining what we're seeing in the phenomena in the heavens. The Bible says that there will be signs in the, in the sun and the moon and the stars. The Bible is very clear about these things, that there will be events happening in the heavens but here lately over the past hundred years not really even that long really since the 1930s and 40s America had, and people have started to really pay attention to oh unidentified flying objects is there really life in outer space let me just be very clear with you for time's sake all it is is demonic manifestation that's all it is there is no life anywhere else because God created life only on the earth You'll never find life anywhere else. But let me explain this to you. There has been a big push in the public, American public society to welcome extraterrestrial life, UFOs. This is going to be what society uses to explain away the rapture of the church. When people are suddenly vanished from the face of the earth, they're going to use this theory of extraterrestrial life that we've entered into a new age. Because you see, people believe in evolution. People believe that this can one day become this, and this can become this. And out of chaos, the world was just created. That, that is what secularists and humanists believe. And so they will very easily accept the idea that when the Christians have vanished from the face of the earth and, and, and the rapture, that all of a sudden, this extraterrestrial life these UFOs that we've talked about, that people have talked about, that this is an explanation because we're heading into a new dementia. We're a dimension, a new age. And the giants will show back up on the face of the earth. And they will draw people's hearts away even further from God. There's a purpose why the giants are still on the earth. Because they're going to be used in the end time. These are demonic, demonic things. And the Bible says, we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness in the unseen realms. Now remember that. Book verse 11, moving quickly. The earth was also corrupt before God. Genesis 6, 11. The earth was also corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now, do we believe the world is like that today? If you can't pull up that slide for me. Sexual morality, the earth filled with violence, and corruption of creation. That is what was found in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. Do you think this is what is found in today's world? Let's look at sexual morality. Let's just look at how it applies to America alone. Sexual morality is at an all-time high. We've twisted, we've twisted the marriage, the institution of marriage. And it's not just marriage, but even in adultery, even in, in, in going from bed to bed to bed, so many people have been bitten by this snake. And you know, if that's you today, let me just tell you, there's still hope. You're still alive. Repent of your sins and come back to the Lord or come to the Lord for the first time. God is not wanting to judge you, but He's wanting to save you. 
And so if there's anyone that is caught up in sexual morality, God loves you. And he wants you to turn to him for the forgiveness of your sins. Because he loves you. He loves you. And he has a plan for you. And it's beautiful. But today, our nation is filled with sexual morality. Guys, the church is filled with sexual morality. Number two, look, the earth filled with violence. Do you see America today filled with violence? So many people are saying today, Houston is such incredible violence happening in Houston. Drive-bys like never before. Am I right? So much, Houston is becoming more and more violent. The earth is filled with violence. Yes, we've always had violence, but it's now more than ever before. People can say, well, because there's more people on the earth. No. No. The earth is filled with violence. And look, and the corruption of creation. Enter transgenderism. A redefinition of your sexuality. That is the corruption of creation. That is what we see happening in society today. It was happening in the days of Noah and Lot. And it is happening today, the corruption of, of humanity. Where, where they're trying to teach, we, we've had kids coming to this church, and they tell us that they're trying to figure out if they're bisexual, homosexual, or heterosexual. They don't know. And it's sad. Because they're believing what their friends at school are telling them. Because this is coming through corrupt people. The book of Romans, at the end of the book of Romans, chapter 1, it says that they do such vile things and they encourage others to do the same. And, and the public education school system in the United States is devouring the kids in secular humanism. It's terrible what is happening. Now again, I'm not standing up here and saying I'm holier than thou, but I can say today that I have a clear conscience with the Lord. And the Lord has changed my heart, your heart, and he's doing a good work today. And so many people may not want to hear this, but it's going to be said because this is the word of God. You know, Satan's final push to destroy humanity, again, will be through extraterrestrial life in outer space. Unidentified finding objects, which is really demonic manifestation. That's all it is. Again, the Nephilim will play a part when the rapture happens. You will have people with supernatural human strength. And the humanists will be able to say, we are entering into a new age. This is how it's going to be now. And as a matter of fact, look at this one man who has the ability to cure cancer. He has the ability to cure all world hunger. It will be the final Antichrist. And, and, and that's what the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says. It says that, For God will cause them to believe the lie because they refuse to believe in the truth that could save them. The churches are empty, but the bingo halls and the dance halls are full. The Lord said, to, the, the king said to the servant, Go, tell them my house is full with food. The banquet is ready. And the servant came back and said, they are making excuses. One has animals they have to tend to. The other one bought some land. The other one said they just got married. They're making up excuses. And the king became angry. And the king said, go back out there. Go into the highways and the byways and, and bring them. I want my house full. This is, this is symbolic of the Lord God Almighty. He doesn't want no one to go to hell. But God is pleading with people. People go to hell because they refuse God. When you die, and listen very carefully, but when you die and leave this earth, if the sin is still upon you, then you have to pay it. That's death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, and it's through Jesus Christ. We know this. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Which will you be able to, 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 to show to the Lord, I have Jesus, or I don't know Jesus? Ephesians 6, 12, we do not battle, wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness, against this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so what does this mean? That what I've been trying to tell you from the very beginning of this message, our battle 
It's with the kingdom of Satan. It's with demonic things. It's in the unseen realm. It, we, we cannot dare think, oh, giants are on the earth. This was a supernatural event that happened, and it's still on the earth, guys. This is something that is manifesting. It's going to manifest. The, you know, we, oh, they see uh, things flying in the sky. The Navy has all these videos now of their fighter pilots capturing these objects moving faster than the speed of, of light or sound, whatever, going from here to there that jets cannot possibly even keep up with them in the middle of the ocean. And these things are going like from, from out, out in the, the outer Earth's atmosphere all the way straight down into the ocean, into the water. They move incredible. Our Navy, our Air Force has this stuff on video. And they're coming out saying now through Congress, we don't understand what this stuff is. None of the governments know what this is. We're being set up for Satan's end time push then the feeling will come into play with this. Again, because let me tell you why. When the rapture of the church happens, and what is the rapture? When Christians worldwide will suddenly go to be with the Lord. There's got to be an explanation. And Satan is going to have an explanation, but it's going to be a lie. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers of darkness. And because the church is so focused on, on elementary teachings, that's what Paul, Paul had a problem with the church. Paul said, you're focused on the laying on of hands and baptism. You're laying on on these elementary truths when we should be going into mature things of the gospel. And, and so many Christians are stuck at level one. And they're going to be sadly mistaken when so many things happen and they, and they miss the rapture because their heart wasn't right before the Lord. We should never be asking for revival. We were meant to never leave revival. When you first became a Christian, did you have revival? Yes, you did. Stay in revival. We should be calling for the, the things of God to come, for the judgment of God to come. Why? Because we're looking forward to the great banquet in heaven. Amen? Amen. And my final scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. Peter says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, He's quoting the Old Testament scripture. He says that I will pour out of my spirit, the Holy Spirit, on all flesh, on the entire body of Christ, on every Christian, we will have the Holy Spirit upon us. Amen? Amen. Do you know what that means? Your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. What does that mean, prophesy? It, it's not just speaking of things to come, but it's also preaching. Preaching the word of God proclaiming the goodness of the Lord, proclaiming His grace, His mercy. That's what it means, guys. Not just being a, a prophet, but preaching the good news. Amen? We will prophesy, men and women. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. You know why I can keep that? Because old men sleep more, so they'll dream more. Amen? <laughs> old men love taking naps. Young men don't take naps. So young men will have visions because it will be in the midst of the day when they're doing something. Remember Peter uh, as a young man? He was on the top of the rooftop of the house and he was praying and he was in a vision. He was not sleeping. Amen? But the old men, they'll be taking naps, sleeping, and they're going to have dreams. That's how I keep that. I have dreams. I've had one vision, but I've had lots of dreams from the Lord. And that's, and that, that, but why is it that we'll have visions and dreams? Because God, as he visited Abraham, he's visiting you to tell you to warn the people of what is coming. To open up the Bible, the book of prophecy, and to explain to the people who will be without excuse. God told you. God warned you. This may be your last opportunity to respond to the salvation of Jesus Christ today. You may get in your car tonight, tomorrow, and it's over. You may lay down at night and never open your eyes in this earth, but only in eternity. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Look, verse 18. He says, And on my men servants, and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. 
they shall speak. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Look at verse 19. God is going to do a wonder with heaven and the earth. Supernatural phenomena, unexplainable phenomena is going to happen in the atmosphere and on the earth. Look, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. I'm under the impression that that vapor of smoke could possibly very well, me and brother uh, Devin talked about this, could very well be the effects of nuclear bombs going off, vapor of smoke. There will be things happening on the earth that God will allow to happen to shake the foundations of humanity in this world. Look, the sun, verse 20, shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and the great and awesome day of the Lord. Before the Lord comes, we're going to see the sun and the moon change. They're not going to give its light. It's going to change. The atmospheric condition is going to change. We're going to see something is going to cause the atmospheric condition to change. What does the scripture say? We are not at battle with flesh and blood, but with powers of darkness in the heavenly realms, in the unseen realm. Understand, guys, the church should understand supernatural things because supernatural things are happening. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's our call every day. Call on Jesus. Call on Jesus and you shall be saved. You know, God's not calling us to understand the Nephilim, the giants, extraterrestrial life, which is demonic manifestation. God's not calling us to understand those things. He just wants us to call on Jesus. But I speak of all these things to give you a little more clarity of why we need to call on Jesus. Because there are things that are happening in the world today that are going to completely mesmerize humanity. Look, you don't believe me? There was a man named Daniel. And Daniel wrote in the Bible that when he wrote of seeing the final Antichrist, the book of Daniel records that he saw these things in our future, even our future, and it says that he fell sick for three weeks. Here's a mighty prophet of God who served under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was a wicked king, who later became a godly king. But Daniel saw incredible things. Daniel was in the lion's den. He saw how ferocious lions could be, and yet he saw God deliver him from the lions. And so Daniel, in his older age, he writes what he sees even in our future, and it made him sick. And when he saw these things, he fell as though dead when he came before the Lord God. Even John the Apostle, when he wrote the book of Revelation, inspired through the Lord Jesus Christ, it said that John, when he saw the spirit of Babylon, that he fell. Wow! That when he saw the angel, he fell at the feet of the angel, and the angel had to tell John, don't worship me, don't fall at my feet, get up, worship God. The, the apostle John was even mesmerized by the things he saw. These mighty men of God, spirit-filled, how much more you and I, when these things are about to happen, if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit today, how much more Will it take us by surprise if we don't have the Spirit of God in us? You know, look, it's not enough. The, 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 you know, the, the, the faith that got you to where you are right now, do you think that's enough faith to sustain you? It's not by might, not by strength, but by His Spirit. And our faith is in His Spirit. My people shall live by faith. I want to encourage you, church. The time is near. The time is near. We see society. Guys, we see politicians. Uh, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. You, just because you're a Republican and a conservative does not mean you're a Christian. We understand that eventually the entire nation will go the way of immorality. And right now we even see that happening with, with all political parties coming together, eventually coming against the Church of Christ in America. Because you see, here's one thing politicians want, and it's power. Do you know who has the power in America? The church. 
the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. The power in every nation is the church. And the power in Russia is the church, the true church. The power in America is the true church of Jesus Christ. And so these people who are controlled by sin, by unbelief in God, they want power. And they know where the real power lies. And that's why they go after, they come against the church. They go after the church because they want that power. And that is why I say we should not put our hope in political things. We should not put our hope in none of these things that, that, that we see in the land, but only in Jesus Christ. Only in the written word of God. Only in the feeling of the Holy Spirit, daily feeling. Amen? We will not fail. He will not leave us as orphans. Amen. Receive that word in the name of Jesus. Give God praise in his house. Amen. Amen. Now, church, that, that is a message that, it's a teaching message, but I, it's a biblical message. And there is so much more that I, that I did not touch on for time's sake because we're limited with time. But, but I, I know that it can get you off in the right direction studying some of these things. And so I just want to encourage you to pray, to seek the Lord with all your mind, body, and soul. The Lord is faithful. He will not abandon you. He will not abandon you. He has not abandoned you. I want to tell you something. As a Christian living in America, we have an, um, the most incredible opportunity to win souls. We have the most incredible opportunity and not just win souls, but even build up the church. Let your life as a Christian, let your life as a Christian strengthen another Christian. Amen? Let your life as a Christian strengthen another Christian. Be a building block, not a stumbling block. Strengthen each other. Love one another. Encourage each other. Support each other. We're not perfect, but you know, we're going to get there together because Christ is leading us. Amen? I thank God in this church. You know, it's, it's not a big grand church here, but there are a lot of praying people in this church, a lot. And I thank God for those people. I thank God because that is what keeps life going, prayer. Prayer. That is what keep, keeps life going. It's what keeps us going in, the, in this race of faith. So let us not, not, not lose perseverance. Let us not neglect the meeting as a church. We only come together three days a week. You're not saved by coming to church. But you strengthen somebody by coming to church. You do. You strengthen someone. And that is what Jesus did. He strengthened us. He came to serve and so when you come to pray, or you come for a service, knowing that you're not just coming for yourself. Because again, I talked about that Friday night. Too many of us can get caught up in selfishness. And we need to be, having a, we have to have a selfless attitude where we're here to serve others. Yes, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm watching my walk with the Lord, but I want to encourage somebody else. That should be our attitude. How can I build up the body of Christ? That should be our goal. That was the goal of the disciples. That was Paul throughout the book of Acts. Paul was always doing things to build the church up. He would go back and visit the churches that he had built up because he wanted to make sure they were growing correctly. And, and we should always be tending to each other, calling each other, looking out for one another. It's not just the job of a pastor or a couple of people. It's all your jobs. You know, I believe that in every church, even small, especially small churches, we should all have each other's phone number. We should all be talking to each other. Sit down and spread yourself around. You ever notice I like to do that when we have fellowships? I like to spread myself around. I do. Because I don't want anyone to feel that, that I'm ignoring them or anything like that because the enemy can attack you in that way. The enemy does attack you in that way. Well, they don't like me because this and because that. And so, love one another. Encourage each other because the time is near. The time is